Hello, this is Pastor Scott Cruz, and we had some technical difficulties last couple of weeks at church, and so I'm going to preach this right into my computer for those of you that missed it and were, have been asking for this, and uh, so we're going to, that's exactly what we're going to do. So just like as if we were in church, I wonder if you would just take a minute and you would pray with me the thing that we pray every week, <coughs> and that is, Jesus, help me to be what you want me to be, do what you want me to do. Because people without you go to hell. We love you, Jesus, and so grateful for the good things that you do for us. Help us, God, to communicate this appropriately and to, and to really get it in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, you can look at my notes right here. These are the notes that I uh, actually preached out of uh, last Sunday. And there's going to be spelling errors in here. And, you know, they're, uh, so it's very sloppy, very messy. Uh, but I just thought that maybe you'd rather look at this than my face as I do this uh, because then you can kind of see where we're at and, and that kind of thing. I'll also put a link to these notes uh, in the video, um, in the notes there too, the show notes kind of. So so here we go. That intro video right there is just kind of a cool little intro video that uh, we had in church that I'm not going to play right here. Um, but you can look at it if you want to. We've been doing the Soul Detox series. And in this series, basically the soul detox, it's kind of like a body detox. But we look in the scripture and we see that soul, our soul is way more important than what our body is. And we know this from Jesus. Um, you know, he, he looks at this and, and Jesus said, What does a profit man to gain the whole world but lose his soul? Another spot, he says, If your hand causes you to sin, Cut it off, because it's better to enter eternity without a hand than for your soul to be destroyed in hell. So your bodies are important, okay? But your soul is infinitely more important than your body, says Jesus. And so we've been talking about the soul detox and flooding ourselves with good stuff to try to flush out the bad stuff. And so that's what we're looking to do today. Now, today we're, talking, we're looking at <coughs> the tortured soul. And how your soul is tortured. Now, when I was a kid, well, you know, there was this, this bigger kid that, that he would do stuff to me to torture me. He'd, he'd grab me, he'd throw me down, he'd put my hands behind my back, and he'd give me what they called a, a bloody 99. And he would hit me on my sternum, bam, 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 99 times until it hurt really bad. Another thing he'd do to me, he would grab me and, he, and he'd, I don't know how I can demonstrate this without you being able to see me, but he would, he would rub his his hand on my forehead really hard. They used to call it a snuggie. Did you ever do snuggies? This would be back in the in the eighties. Uh, you would hit, you know, scrub my forehead until my head would get warm, and and it was a, a snuggie. Nothing used to do is he would grab me and he put me down, and and he'd hold me down, and the dog would lick me in the face. And if the dog didn't want to lick me in the face, one time he took and he put peanut butter in my nose. So the dog would lick in my nose to get the peanut butter out of my nose. And then, as if that wasn't enough, I guess the nose got too boring. He took and he pinched my cheeks. And then he, and he, and he so when I opened my mouth, he got his, he, I'm doing it right now. So this is going to sound kind of funny. Okay, so if you can see me, try to imagine this. He, he's got his fingers in my mouth like this so that I, I couldn't close my mouth because my cheeks were pinched between my, uh, between my, his fingers. And so, and then he did that, and then the dog could lick right in my mouth and lick all over the place inside of my mouth. Another time, he had this, this, uh, like a baseball bat. It was a baseball bat. <clears throat> and he would, uh, again, I, I wish, maybe I should have videotaped this. You can see it better. Um, he would have his hands apart on the baseball bat and then swing it until his hands came together. And then it would stop suddenly. And so he was seeing how close to my head he could get without hitting me. And, and with this baseball bat. Now, I probably don't need to tell you that uh, eventually he got too close and snucked me right in the forehead. He tortured me, man. Now, I got to tell you, um, you might have figured this out already. Uh, but um, if my brother is listening to this, he probably has figured this out. Actually, I'm the one who did all of that to my little brother. And so if you ever thought that Pastor Scott is a really nice guy, just know that I'm really not. Um, and I did all of those things to my little brother. But you want to know something funny? Is the bigger that my brother got, 
the better that we actually got along, believe it or not, you know. Because when we got into high school, I, I, I played guitar and he played football. And so uh, the bigger he got, the, the better we got along. And so I don't do that to my, uh, you know. Although I have to admit, I have let the dog lick Elizabeth's face before. And so, um, but then she says, Minnie, lick me more. And so she, I'm really not torturing her. I think she kind of likes it. Anywho, the key thought for this series has been, we are not a body with a soul, but we are a soul with a body. And some people's souls are tortured, okay? Our, their souls are tortured. So what is it that is torturing these souls? I want to tell you the thing that is torturing your soul and tortures souls the most is very simply sin. And it's in what, the war that it wages on you. First Peter chapter 2, verse 11, it says, Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers of the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Sinful desires war against your soul. In Romans chapter 7, you can read it. And, saw, and the Apostle Paul is, is wrestling with this. You know? He's saying, what I want to do, I don't do. And what I don't want to do, I do. And, and, and he's going back and forth. Why do I do the things that I don't want to do? And, and he's tortured by the sin. And so many Christians all right, are supposed to be forgiven. They're normal on the inside, but on the inside they're dying a spiritual death. And I'm here to tell you today that the enemy's biggest tactic against you to keep you from serving God is by torturing your soul as a result of the sin. So what tortures our souls? Number one, we're tortured by things that we have done. <clears throat> Psalms chapter 38 verse 3, my bones have no soundness because of my sin. My guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too guilty to bear. Too guilty to bear. Some of you have got sin that when you're in the quietness of the night, when you're all by yourself, it comes to your head. It comes to your head. And, you know, and it may look like this. You know, you're, you've done something wrong, and the enemy uses that against you. Maybe you've told lies. And, when, and you, you can't look that person in the, in the eye anymore. Maybe you cheated. Maybe you've overeaten. You know, and you, and you binge yourself. And you feel so guilty. And you don't want anybody to know. Maybe you're somebody who has spent so much money. That it, you've just blown money. Maybe worse than that. Maybe rather than just overspending. Maybe you gambled it away. And the people in your life were, were uh, hurt as a result of your gambling. Maybe you've been lying about your finances. Maybe you're addicted to some kind of substance or your credentials. You are, you are hurt by what you've done. Or number two, you're tortured by the lies you believe. Now look at this, John chapter 8, verse 44. It says, the devil was a murderer from the beginning. Not holding on to the truth, for there is no truth in him. And when he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. John 8, 44. The enemy says that if they knew you, they could not love you. The lie that the enemy tells about the sin that, that you've done and you've said to God for to forgive you, he says, you know what, if they knew the real you, they would realize that you're a fraud. If they knew the real you, they would realize that you are unlovable and you are a, you're a snake. And, and that, the reason it's a lie is, is I want to tell you a secret. All those shiny, happy people in their nice clothes on Sunday mornings, every one of them is screwed up on the inside. How do you know, Pastor Scott? Because I've been pastoring for a while and I know they're all screwed up on the inside. I know they're all screwed up on the inside and I know I'm here to tell you today that I'm screwed up on the inside. There's stuff I've done that I'd be ashamed of for you to find out about that I've obviously told people in my life, you know, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But, um, you know, there's uh, the enemy lies to you. He connects what has happened with who you are. He, he tries to tell you that you, you did bad, therefore you are bad. You are unlovable. You're a, you failed, so now you are a failure. Anything you put your hand to, it's just going to turn to gunk. Because you're a failure. You've blown it. So why not just 
keep on going forward. You kind of like a diet, you know, you've been dieting, you've been doing good, and then you binge out one day and you eat a quart of ice cream, and you're like, man, I've blown it, so I might as well just eat like crazy now. And that's what the enemy tries to do to you. You can't tell anyone because if they really knew you, they wouldn't like you. They could not love you if they really knew you. You, are, you think you're taking your secret to the grave, but actually your secret is taking you to the grave. So what you've got to do is you've got to tell your soul two things. Number one, it's better to confess your sins than to hide your sins. He who conceals his sin does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them, he finds mercy. Proverbs 28, 13. When you try to hold in your sin, it's like a poison. But when you let it out, you find mercy. It's like food poisoning. It lives inside of you and it makes you sick. Unconfessed sin is a poison to the soul. So here's how to confess your sin. The trick is you've got to confess it. You've got to get it out of you. Okay? Get it out of you. Number one, we confess to God for the forgiveness of our sins. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins to God, He is faithful and just, and He will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And you know what? God's forgiveness and His blessing and His love for you is total and is complete. You can trust Him, you can rest in Him, and God is going to take care of you. And He's going to let, He is so good and so beautiful and so able to come always completely and totally confess your, sin, your sins to Him. Now, a lot of people can do this part easier. Okay? A lot of people can do this part easier. And I don't know if it's because God seems farther away. If he seems a little more abstract, but sometimes people can do this. But there is another step that you need to take with your sin in order to really get healed of it. So you confess your sins to God to get forgiven. Okay? But number two, we confess to people for healing from our sins. That's much harder. That's a lot harder. James 5, 16. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you can be healed. Now, I know that someone comes to me and they say, Pastor, I've got to tell you something I've never told anybody before. When they say that, I know the healing is coming. When they say that, I know that their lives are about to change. It is, it's really good. Now, I've heard this conversation a lot of times. Sometimes they, they can get a, a sentence in and I can finish the story for them. Everybody thinks their sin is so unique to them. They don't realize that everybody is dealing with the same junk. I was in high school and I had this sin in my life and, and I felt so guilty about it. And, and finally, I went to my pastor and I said, Pastor, I, I need to tell you something that, that has been beating me up and and I told him, and he said, oh yeah, I struggle with that. I said, what? Oh yeah, I struggle with that. And, and here's how I deal with it and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, really? I'm not the only sicko in the world that struggles with this? I felt so alone in my sin. And that's what the enemy does. He says, you are gross. You are disgusting. What you've done is so much worse than what everybody else has done. <laughs> it happened to me another time. I went to my, uh, my, my mentor when I was a young person, a guy named John Peterson. I told him, you know, I'm struggling with this thing. And I'm such a loser. And you're probably not even going to want to be around me anymore. Oh, yeah, I, I deal with that. And here's how I deal with it. And, here's, and, and it lifted it from my shoulders. And both um, my pastor and my mentor said to me, um, I still believe in you. God's going to use you. I still love you. And here's how we can get through this together. And they prayed with me. And it was, it was good. It had happened to me just a little while ago. Someone came to me and, and uh, talking to me. And I, and I had known that something was wrong for a couple of months. I, and, but I, my guess of what was really going on what, it turned out to be wrong. But I knew something was wrong. Okay, And they come to me and say, Pastor, I, I got to tell you this. And this happened and this, this addiction I had, it bit me again and I feel so guilty and I'm such a loser. I'm never going to get through this. And, 
And and I said to him, man, had you told me this about this two months ago, I could have told you then that I love you and I believe in you. And God is going to do great, huge things in your life. And my opinion of you has not gone down. The reality is, man, this is all just part of the journey. And God is going to use this. And I was able to love on him. Such freedom comes when you share your sin. The thing that just makes you feel so yucky on the inside. And you share it to somebody and they still love you. Oh, oh, it's so good. It's so good. They still love you and they believe in you. Now, I, I have to, I'm going to qualify this just a little bit. You don't have to tell everyone everything. Okay? And, but you have to tell someone everything. Something. Let me give you a quick example. Some years ago, someone came to me and they said, Pastor, I want to share a testimony in church. Now, I had gained a little wisdom by that point. And I said to them, what do you want to share? Because <laughs> you don't want to get surprised too much when you put somebody up there. And they say to me, well, I want to tell everybody about how I was a prostitute. And da 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 and they wanted to share this in front of the church. Now, I'm going to give you a little bit of context. Maybe there would be circumstances where that would be okay to share. Um, in, in our community, pr- there aren't a lot of prostitutes around. If someone gets arrested for prostitution, it makes the 6 o'clock news. And I can only think of two or three times in my life that I have even saw that, okay? Which is pretty awesome. They show the John. They show the, you know, the prostitute, whatever. And this thing that happens. Um... But there was another reason, and, and you know, because they, when she said this, my my first thought was, uh, you know, that, you know, what, uh, you know, you must be one homely prostitute. <laughs> anyway, that was, but I didn't want that to be what everybody else was thinking, and I didn't want when people looked at this person because she was a pretty young Christian, and, and, and a little unstable still, and I, I didn't want uh, when people looked at her, their first thought to be, you know. She used to be a prostitute. Oh my goodness. Blah, 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 blah. Now, it would have been more appropriate for her to share that with, with a, someone that she trusted, to share that, even, maybe even a small group where they were really had a, had a good standard of confidentiality. But I didn't want um, shallow minded idiots to look at her and their first thought to think, oh yeah, there's a prostitute. I just don't want to put that on her. So I want to encourage you. You don't have to tell everybody everything, okay? But you do have to tell somebody something. Now, the mark of maturity that you can look for is the time span between your sin and your confession, okay? That's how you can tell you're getting mature. Now, we all sin. Uh, you're a pastor. If you go to the rock, uh, he's a sinner. I'm telling you right now, he screws up. Uh, he does things that, that uh, he'd be embarrassed to share on Sunday, though I, I tend to share more than a lot of people on, on Sundays. Um, but, that's we're all in this together, right? So Christ who wants to set you free. Hey soul, my Jesus is big enough to do it. And Lord, you say that I'm good, therefore I must be okay, and you love me, so I'm gonna keep on moving forward. First Corinthians chapter ten, verse thirteen, no temptation has seized you except that which is common to man. And God is faithful, he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. He is a good, good God. There's always a way out. 1 Peter 2.24 He himself bore our sins on the tree so that we can die to our sins and live in righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you are like sheep gone astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your soul. So detox, get the junk out by confessing. Confess to God and get clean and then get the healing that God wants for you by telling somebody about it. And it will set you free. He wants to do that. He wants to set you free. The one and greatest tactic the enemy has is for you to sin and then you feel guilty about your sin and you go to church and you feel gross. And you feel uncomfortable. And I've had people tell me, oh, I I go to church and I just don't feel right. Well, you know why you don't feel right in church? Is because the enemy is telling you that your sin is unique. Because you're feeling less than. Now, there's a conviction that comes that is good. 
and you should feel guilty about your sin because the reality is your sin is disgusting and removes you from God. But when you go to God and you say, Jesus, I'm sorry, please forgive me, and you release it, the, the guilt that you feel after that is called condemnation, different than conviction. And that condemnation is a feeling of unworthiness after you have released it to God. I want to tell you that that is not from God. And how do you get through that? Well, you go to church anyway. You go to a small group anyway. You sin and you feel like garbage. But then you go to church and you lift your hands and you say, Jesus, I need your help. I want you to forgive me. You tell some of your Christian brothers or sisters about what you're going through and they say, I've been there too. I love you and I believe in you. I want to tell you, I like to think that that's the kind of people that we have at The Rock. We're screwed up. <laughs> Every one of us. But thank you, Jesus. We are moving towards perfection. We are moving toward that eternal place. God is so good and He loves you so much. So, what do you want to take away from this more than anything? You're a sinner. Yeah. So confess your sin to God and get forgiven. But then confess your sin to a brother or sister that you trust and get healed. That's powerful, man. That is powerful. And you'll get healed. I want to encourage you, come to the rock, to be all that you were created to be. May the Lord richly bless you, and I hope to see you in church on Sunday.